So show of hands here, who has not ridden in an Uber before? Forrest, I took care of you last night. <laughs> who here has never heard of Uber before? Okay, so our marketing efforts are working. For those of you who put your hand up the first time, check it out, please. My name is Kevin Novak. I run several of the data science initiatives at Uber. I just wanted to share with you some of the cool stuff we've been digging into. We're right before lunch, so this is heavy on pictures and light on math. Uh, I'm going to skim through this pretty quick, given the familiarity. Uh, Uber's an on-demand ride-sharing service founded by Travis Kalanick and Garrett Camp. Uh, they're brilliant. They're our fearless leaders. Travis runs day-to-day. -day. Garrett is our strategic advisor. Uh, at a high level, Uber is a company that uses transportation to become a cross between lifestyle and logistics. So lifestyle, give me what I want. Give it to me right now. Logistics, give it to me quickly. Uh, make sure that it's a reliable, efficient market. Ch charge me a price which I consider fair for whatever you're bringing me. Um, the, to put that into the marketing words, a reliable, high-quality ride at every price point, or the canonical example, everyone's private driver. Um, a little bit about us as a team. I got about 20 people, um, mainly focusing on an engineering, the engineering end of data science. A few anal an analysts. Uh, we're a Python and JavaScript company. Uh, it's all powered by a massive Postgres cluster backed by a vertical warehouse. Amazon Web Services is our best friend. We don't have a Hadoop cluster yet, probably coming this year. Um, and we're massive fans of open source projects, data science, engineering. Uh, please check out our GitHub account. There's a lot of cool stuff on there. So what I wanted to do, given the lifestyle and logistics sort of theme of the company, was break up our data science initiatives into these broad spectrum buckets. Um, so speaking with logistics, the main themes which we're talking about here, um, efficiency, give me something as quick as possible, reliability always has to be there. Um, and what that really boils down to on an economics and a data science front is building a marketplace. Building marketplace, optimize the marketplace, monitor the market. This word just keeps coming up and up and up. So one of the major projects that we have to do when it comes to efficiency is this concept of supply positioning. Um, given a certain number of cars who have partnered with us, how many do we expect to have working with us? We don't own any of the cars. This is a strict business partnership. So drivers can work when they'd like to. Thankfully, they're human beings, so they're a bit predictable. Uh, and so given the number of cars they're working, uh, where do we expect them to work? And how does that match up to our expected amount of demand, which is just how many people will open the app and how many people will, will request? So we got an ins uh, inspiration from weather heat maps, um, very real heat. Um, and what that looks like uh, on the back end. So what we've done is we've generated a whole series of uh, heat maps that we show to drivers. And essentially what we're trying to solve here on the positioning front is I am given driver X. I would like to know where all the other drivers are working in such a way that I can maximize my per profit potential. And the neat thing about that is when we optimize for an individual driver's business interest, we optimize for sort of the group's economic behavior as well. It's a nice type thing where Individual capitalist sense works well for Uber sort of group business sense. Um, these are several prototypes we've demoed. We've done everything from uh, neighborhood driven heat maps like in the top left, um, playing with our D3 skills in the top right, getting something a little fuzzier, uh, outlines. We've also just showed trying drivers, various. This, for example, is just the location of the nearest 50 drivers. All of these are monitored, measured. Uh, every single one of our drivers is usually demoing one or more of these in a given week for us. So how do we monitor this? What are we looking at? So this is an example of a graph, one of few, I promise, um, looking at ETAs, essentially how much time does it take a given car to reach a customer on the y-axis as a function of sort of the utilization of our fleet. So down here at the low end, what you're seeing is we have more cars than demand. This is just a flooded marketplace. Uh, takes on the order of a minute and a half to get to a customer. Uh, as cars become more and more occupied, you start to have fewer and fewer cars available. Obviously, arrival times will start to stretch, uh, take longer and longer to get to a customer. Obviously, if there are no cars available, the ETA would be infinite. 
The interesting thing about this is the shape of this curve has a lot to do with how we as a data science team optimize our marketplace. If we could lower the arrival time, the cost of fulfillment of a given trip at high rates of business, we're helping drivers get to customers quicker and do their jobs better, um, but also freeing up more slack in our system to, to help ourselves run our business a little bit better. So the interesting thing is when you take a graph like the prior one and turn it into what we call our driver's efficiency, essentially, um, how much time would a driver spend making money as a fraction of the total amount of time he's working on a given system, you get a graph like this. And this is actually very interesting in that the efficiency rate, of, or the optimal efficiency rate occurs somewhere about 80 to 85 percent utilized. So we can keep 15 percent of our cars open, and that's a good thing. Um, for an individual driver, that's sometimes a counterintuitive point to make, but on average they will spend more money, or more time making money, if they spend 15% of their time doing nothing. <laughs> On the reliability front, um, so we have two major projects, our ETA engine, which I was discussing very briefly before, as well as dynamic pricing, everybody's favorite part of Uber. We've made a lot of friends. <laughs> um, so this was uh, results from a data post we did. It's getting a little stale at this point, but comparing the ETA predictions um, that the individual in-house Uber ETA engine makes compared to the Google Maps API direction estimates. Uh, as you can see, we're almost 50% better, uh, or excuse me, twice as good, 50% less uh, than, than Google. And to be fair, it's not a fair competition. I get free information like either he's driving a Chevy Tahoe or a Prius, or in Paris, he's driving a motorcycle. This is very key information about how well you can get through rush hour traffic. I also know how aggressive a given driver is, or how slow a given driver is. Um, th so it's not a fair competition, but what it does manifest itself is a better experience for our customers. <coughs> Take a, a given ETA spectrum and plot it on the map. As Drew was saying, everybody loves a map. <laughs> Um, so what you're looking at, this is San Francisco, downtown. Um, red is lower ETAs on the order of 10 minutes out in the suburbs to downtown on the order of two minutes or less. This is, uh, I think, current as of about August. So we've uh, onboarded more drivers, brought on more information, lowered these even further. But the really interesting thing you see about it is you can actually start to pick out streets downtown just by looking at arrival times. It reminds me a lot of these top-down views you have of a given space looking down at the city. Um, one of those really cool aw shucks data moments for me personally. And surge pricing. <laughs> I wanna, this is a project I actually ran personally for about a year and a half. Um, near and dear to my heart, happy to talk some more on this afterwards as well. Usually a popular lunchtime discussion. Uh, so for those of you who have ridden Uber, you've probably seen a screen like this once or twice before. Um, one of the interesting things about this from an economics perspective is this is probably one of the purest examples of how you can measure a customer's price elasticity live on the fly. Um, what you're looking at here is the conversion rate on this surge screen. So essentially how many people tap the button to the number of people who saw it as a function of price multiplier. Uh, the colored dots, red was before January. Green was, if any of you remember, there was uh, a two-week period in mid-December when price multipliers got a little bit high. I apologize, we were running an experiment in New York City, but we got great data out of it. So those are the green dots. <laughs> um, and then blue is, is New Year's Eve and beyond. So what you can actually see is um, we've got several of these. This is actually a more fascinating one, and it highlights a little bit about how customers' behavior changes over time. One of the greatest examples here in Chicago, this gap, this sort of, uh, I'm gapping in the word, the gap you're seeing here at 2x, this is actually an example of how customers become acclimatized to surge pricing. So in Chicago, they don't raise prices beyond 2x very often. So what happens is as soon as you see 2.25x, there's almost a perception gap, um, which gives this huge nonlinear behavior that you don't see for example, in New York, because New Yorkers are used to paying ridiculous prices for everything. <laughs> At least that's my West Coast bias. I'm based out of San Francisco. 
little bit on lifestyle as well. Um, a little bit fewer graphs, but these are a lot of the projects which we are also uh, in charge of running at Uber. Um, and the point I wanted to make here is that in a lot of companies, data size is a product role or it's sort of a strategic where are we steering the company. At Uber, it's an engineering philosophy. These are all things in the app powered by data scientists who wrote the code, who pushed it, sometimes breaking it. But um, all of this gives an opportunity for people with a traditionally quantitative background to really have an engineering impact to the company in a very meaningful way. So what's next? I always love doing this because I get to share something which has not yet been seen before. <laughs> I just kid. This is actually a promo we did with, with GE uh, on their Brilliant Machines campaign. By far and away the most uh, powerful promo uh, we've ever done. Not as far as revenue, but certainly as far as virality. Everybody's a child of the 80s, myself included. Uh, got a little nostalgic. So the interesting concept that I wanted to talk about a little bit was how we can use surge pricing to not just necessarily uh, diminish demand and encourage drivers to work with us, but how economic incentives become a geospatial positioning tool. And so we have a project which is called GeoSurge. Um, this is an example of one of the versions of the app currently live in New York City. It's live in New York, San Francisco, LA, and a few other marketplaces. But essentially in a working beta release. And essentially what we could do is we've broken New York City up into an arbitrary number of polygons. I think in this case it was seven or eight, also customizable in the back end, that we could surge those mo or surge those regions independently of each other. So what happens is say you've got a driver who's in Brooklyn, there's no way in heck of going to Manhattan during rush hour. But if we say, well, we'll give you double rates or triple rates because the market demands it, suddenly you get to use surge pricing as a way to sort of move your supply throughout a uh, city. I'm sure Owen would love to come up with a way of doing this with bikes. <coughs> so, did it work? This is San Francisco data. So this is actually a simplified version of the plot I was showing earlier of ETAs versus utilization. And what you're looking at is the blue is the prior pre-geo surge opportunity. Red is post-geo surge opportunity or excuse me, uh, post geo surge window. Um, and what you're seeing is uh, positioning cars at high rates of business utilization is exactly what the point of geo surge was. And you can see um, what you're looking at here is that 90% utilization, Ubers get to customers five minutes faster. It's a rather significant drop. What that looks like when you graph that on the ETA's chart, I'm sorry, the red ver or the blue versus green didn't quite come out except for the front row. Um, is that drivers make 5% more money on GeoSurge, and that has nothing to do with extra revenues. That's just about helping them position themselves better to access more trips when we're at a higher rate of utilization. Extra Q&A, extra time. I'm low on, I always include extra slides because I can share some of these. Um, actually, you know what? I got a minute and a half. Let's do it. <laughs> so I changed my mind. Um, so surge pricing, One of the, this is, uh, as, as we were talking about victorious successes, I like to share the flaming failures. Um, this is probably the single most important message I ever learned when I was running the surge pricing project. How you say something is just as important as what you say. This is the very first surge pricing screen designed by yours truly. Uh, my favorite is the left aligned icon on the bottom. <laughs> um, one of the interesting things any graphic designer could tell you is that the most key piece of information on this screen, the multiplier, is buried in a wall of text in size 12 font. Um, if it's hard to read now, imagine reading it on your iPhone. So what happens when you look at a conversion rate versus price multiplier uh, graph is using this screen, as prices go up, customers want your product more. This is the best business to be in. <laughs> um, so what's, what's actually going on here is there's a hidden variable. We have economic scarcity. If we're raising prices for Ubers, that's because there aren't very many available. If there aren't very many Ubers available, I guarantee there's nothing else available. Uh, and so what people are responding to is, I need to get home. I need to get home right now. It's 10 degrees below zero and three in the morning on New Year's Eve. I don't <laughs> care. Just get me home. So what we ended up doing was we didn't touch a single thing. Well, we sent all the data scientists on other projects, hired a graphic designer designed a screen, something similar to this, 
stupidly large multiplier in a different color, and you get a, a completely different customer behavior response. So this is really cool. So what this tells me as a data scientist is I can build the best model in the world, but if I build a terrible product that goes around it, then it's functionally useless. Uh, this is a good sort of teaching point for all of our new modelers who just think it's all about the ECOD and the math. Uh, we can skip that. Uh, this is another way we look at supply coverage. Essentially, all these circular maps are regions that a car could be dispatched to. Essentially, you can just look at the overlap of all these various regions as a good way of sort of measuring reliability and supply. And I think I'm going to stop there. Thank you.